Friday night chillant also. You're Friday night chillant guy? Uh, Saturday day chillant guy. No. So you, you I, would, gotta, I would always get it at shul when I, I would go to like the teen minion <laughs> and, and like my rabbi from like my school would always have chillant for us like after we finished it was the best. All right, everybody, welcome to episode number 37. We of think. <laughs> mislabeled. I'm pretty sure it's going to be 37. Um, that's the way I see this, at least going. But uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. First and foremost, please like, subscribe, comment. We are right now in LA. We flew to LA to shoot this podcast. So, again, if you're watching this, we are hustling this podcast. Like, we are doing everything <laughs> and anything to make this explode. And I'm not shy about admitting that. So, we're in LA. Like, subscribe, comment. Uh, secondly, this podcast is brought to you and sponsored by EA Tax Advisors. EA Tax Advisors uh, is a tax is a I apologize tax liability strategy firm. Basically, they try to reduce your liability when it comes to taxes using a variety of financial instruments um, and setting you up in a very specific way um, that you avoid as much taxes as possible. I have used them. I wouldn't sell something that I personally haven't used or endorse something that hasn't brought me great benefit. They've saved me a ton of money. Uh, this is for 1099 employees and people that are self-employed. Okay, now that that's out of the way, we have an extremely, extremely special guest, but before we get to him, Zach, how are you doing? How are you doing feeling? Great. Doing great, doing great. Awesome, you look ready to go. I am rocking my bless up hoodie. Shout out Tribe of Judah. Shout, shout out Friend Tribe of mine. Judah. Got me some free swag. Okay, so I obviously want to turn- His name's Tribe Judah? Tribe of Judah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I obviously want to turn our attention to our guest. We have on with us David Mazus. Is that pronounced? Killed it. Killed it, yeah. I killed it. Killed okay, it. awesome. David. Many people haven't in the past, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I worked on that for the last couple of weeks, whatever, <laughs> since you told me you're working. I think, I, think, I think it was at San Diego Comic-Con where one of the moderators, one of the years, just absolutely butchered everybody's name, even the easy names. And I think I was David Mazo. So I've, I've gotten Mr. Z. I've gotten much worse. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, I just. I, by the way, I'm I'm known for butchering. <laughs> yeah, the it's name. fantastic. That's my well, I appreciate you working on it. Yeah. My last name is Weiner, so it's just a weird combination. Of it, <laughs> to be totally honest. It's like I butcher everyone's whatever. So you hope people to butcher your name. Yeah, it'd be good for me. <laughs> right, you do them with your hope in the studio. I'm trying to like set the standard. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, yeah. Um, no, but seriously speaking, uh, David, thank you again for coming on. In, in your words, just because to be honest, you're you're obviously pretty well known. Um, but in our world, I feel like not everyone knows you. I'm talking about the Orthodox world for sure in New York. Um, I don't think that many people know you. So what what are you famous for? Can you just tell everyone what you're well, most known for? Yeah, I mean, I, so I've been acting since I was about five years old. Um, I was on a TV show called Gotham in which I played Bruce Wayne um, from when I was 13 to just before I turned 18. Um, and so that's what most people know me for. And surprisingly, I, I actually think that a large percentage of people that know me are from the orthodox jewish world especially in new york for some really? reason like whenever i there's there's certain demographics that whenever i'm in those demographics like whenever whenever i go to new york and i meet some orthodox jews like i don't know they're like for example i so i i, I grew up orthodox myself um I, I don't know if that's why or if gotham has just happens to be popular within the orthodox community M maybe not so much anymore but at least a few years ago um but I would go to, have you guys ever heard of Sarah Check at YU? Yeah, of course. Basketball yeah. tournament? Okay, so I, I went like three years in a row because, you know, my best friends were like on the team. Oh, are um, you a bowler? I'm not. I wish I was. I'm, Bro, don't worry. You, I'm, got, you got gigs going for I'm you right I'm terrible. <laughs> well, because yeah, all my friends still like to play basketball, and I, I wish that I could contribute something more to the court than like a heinous amount of turnovers, but <laughs> um, it doesn't right. really happen for me. Um, but anyway, whenever, whenever I would go You're to Sarah Check, I would, I would actually, like, I never have to act like, you know, a celebrity, like, you know, hiding my dinner. But, like, whenever I was at Sarah Check, I'd have to, like, put a hood on because, like, a oh, really? wow. bunch of, like, little kids, like, 13-year-old, like, you know, payas and keepas would have to would, No way. Like, come up You're getting mobbed and, by like, the payas crowd. Yeah. I was going to say, maybe that's the answer. Maybe we're just a generation above, and he's from the 13 to 20 year old generation. Maybe. How old are you right now? Yeah, kids younger than me for sure. Are yeah. I think that's what Gen it might Z be. versus we're millennials. millennials. Yeah. yeah, that might be what Someone it is. Someone called me an elder millennial. I got really upset recently. <laughs> elder millennial. I didn't like that at all. How old are you? I'm 29. I don't think that's an elder millennial. Thank you. I think Thank an elder you. millennial is like pushing 40 right now. I like, I like you a lot. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait one second. So growing up, you start the show at 13 years old. Just the obvious question. What is it like? Are you in high school during this time and like doing school? Seventh grade. You start in seventh grade, and yeah. you're you're able to manage school while being an actor, and obviously a, it's a real show. It's not like it's not like a little side 
show, right? It's Gotham is a legit show. So it was on Fox, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Large, so large production. you're able to be in school and do that at the same time. Yeah. Um, so basically the way it works is I have a studio teacher. I had a studio teacher, um, who would basically homeschool me. I would, I would get tutored one-on-one -on -one. and for my Judaic studies, because I always went to a Jewish school as well. Um, for when I was in high school, at least it was different in middle school. I honestly don't remember how it worked in middle school, but, um, the majority of the show, I was in high school, and the, my, the, the, the head of like, Judaic studies at my high school, Shalhevet, in Los Angeles, um, his brother lived in New York, and he would like, come over to my apartment and tutor me and all the things that, in like, Israel studies and Hebrew language and um, all those things that you know, I'd learn at my school. But essentially, yeah, I would have a studio teacher. I'd be homeschooled. I would learn one-on-one -on -one with um, either the studio teacher on set um, or his name was Tani, my principal's brother. And... Um, and there's just a bunch of child labor laws for school, um, for schooling with minors. Like I have to get, uh, a, an average of three hours of schooling per day, a minimum of one hour per day, a maximum of five hours per day. Only ha I can only get school in, um, in 20 minute chunks or more. Um, really? yeah. So I, I could go into more of these, but it's not that interesting. Wow. But, but the, the point is that there is an entire handbook. Um, I think I forget what it's called, but I think it's called like the minor, like, um, child labor, ch child labor law handbook, or something like that, but for specifically for actors um, that details so all of these laws. Some of those made sense, but what's with the twenty minute chunks? Well, so no, that makes it's, sense. It's basically because, like, if if but you know, between takes, they can't just send me upstairs for five minutes and right. I can't get anything done. I'm gonna sit down, it means it open needs my book. At least twenty minutes has to be at least twenty minutes. Oh, I thought, I thought twenty minute max. No, no, twenty no, minute no, chunks no. or at more. At least makes more yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> there um, we go. So this is all, these are the laws around being homeschooled and being able to yeah. act, do acting. But I also didn't really consider myself as homeschooled at all because I was always enrolled in Shalhevet, which is a private Jewish day school in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and whenever I had a week off of filming or some kind of break, I would fly home and go to school. And, um, really? Yeah. And go back to Shalhevet. Go back to Shalhevet. And for the last three months of the year, that's when we'd have our hiatus because we only shot nine months out of the year. We shot from the beginning of summer to the beginning of spring. So for all of spring, I would just be in school. Um, so like the last you know quarter of the year, I'd always just be in school regularly and be a regular kid. So I, it, was, it was like I was doing, I was, I was homeschooled, but with my school's curriculum at the same pace as my school's curriculum. And then I would just like pop back into school. Wow. Interesting. So How you were shooting in New York and basically going back whenever you weren't shooting, coming back here. To I, was, I was bi-coastal. I was flying back all the time. Wow. I was, shot in New York. Shot in New York, yeah. I, I feel like most Batman things are, New like, York. are shot in New York. It's yeah. pretty goth of me there. Well, yeah. I mean, Batman was, it took place in New York for the first, I think, like five years ish. And then they changed, they wanted to make it a mythical city. So they made it Gotham, but Gotham is just a nickname of New York. You, yeah, you know a lot more about Batman. I actually, I do know a lot about Did Batman. Did you know a lot about Batman before <laughs> playing no, Batman? No, not necessarily. So you, you, Batman you, was always my favorite superhero, but I did a lot of research. Okay. Yeah, I read like, a lot. Of you read a lot of comics. <laughs> yeah, I read a lot of. Can comics. you imagine like that's your research for role? You're just pounding comic books. Yeah, so fun. Also, that's I great. heard that your actual birthday is the same birthday as Batman. How crazy is that? That's the most insane. It thing. It still blows my mind. That's wild. I'm telling you, there's a Hashem in the world. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You were destined for that role. Yeah, <laughs> that's unbelievable. So wait a second. So the school's like basically cool with you coming, going the whole nine yards. Um. Well, made exception. They, yeah, I mean, we had, we had, we had a meeting, but before I enrolled in the school, we had a meeting with them and, you know, we were like, this is how it's going to work. Like, you right. know, or can, not. can you, can you, can you do this with us? Right. Can you like help me out? Can I be an exception? And Shalhevet said yes. And they, they, well, they, they wanted to help and they were super cooperative. The administration was super cooperative. You know, every once in a while I'd have a teacher that was like, wouldn't want to, cause you know, for, cause like some, some classes, for example, like math, it's pretty easy to not be in the actual classroom because like I can just open up the textbook and, and like learn the shit. But, um, you know, history, for example, like there was no textbook, the professor would just give lectures and he wouldn't want to send his lecture notes because he'd be worried that I would send them to like the other kids. Uh. And, um, and so he'd be like, he, you know, sometimes he'd be really uncooperative, but the administration always had my back in, in those fights. Wow. Wow. That's unbelievable. So, I mean, are your friends- And I, and I, and I considered going to, you guys know Heschel? Yeah, sure. I considered going to in Heschel. New York. In New York, yeah. yeah. Um, well, why but, don't you do that? Why don't you just go to high school in New York? Well, I- Listen, <laughs> so I wanted to, I mean, I knew, because regardless whether I was in New York or LA, like I, I would be out of school a lot of the days because I'd be shooting and I would need to do this, you know, the whole, the whole studio right. teacher thing. Um, and I, we, we talked to Heschel, we had a conversation with them and they kicked, they, they laughed at us. They were like, no, we're not, they're we're, not into we're it. not doing extra stuff. Also, those and are I two different to to types of school. schools. Is Shalhev is not orthodox, right? Yeah. It's Heschel not. is, um, I believe, I have a friend who's a rabbi, I believe it's like conservative or maybe even reform. Mm-hmm. Just, you able, are you able to like function normally with all your friends? They're obviously like yeah. uh, all over you is the wrong word, but like I, I don't know what it would be like if like I had a kid in my class who was just like on a show on on Fox. Like, how, <laughs> what was that experience like for you? 
It was super chill. Because to be honest, so Shalhevet had, I, my graduating class was 65 people. Super small. As you can imagine, I'm sure a lot of Jewish schools are like that. And a lot of these kids, out of that 65, probably like half of them I had known since I was like way before I started acting. Right. Just, just because of the nature of the Jewish community. Right. Like you all grow up together and there's not that many of you. Um, and so like everybody knew me for David. They, they like the majority, all, all that to say, the, the majority of the kids knew me before any of this acting stuff. So they, they were kind of along for the journey. So it wasn't like, it, it wasn't weird. Right. Were, I, I was, I was, I was very way. much a normal kid. You're just friends with them. It's cool. people who meet you after you've already become famous that might treat you differently. But yeah. the people who know you before, they keep you grounded, right? Exactly. Cool. Right. You were also, uh, I did, when I was looking you up, obviously, I saw you were also uh, in The Office. Yeah. You did an episode in The Office. I That's did. really cool. When I was nine. That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you even get into, like, you're a nine-year-old acting stuff. Is that you at nine being like, I want to do this? Or is it your parents thinking, like, you can do this and they want to bring you to auditions? So, so, like I said, I started taking classes, acting classes, when I was five years old. I got into it because my sister, who's three years older than me, so she was eight, um, really wanted to do acting classes because of a story that I don't necessarily have to get into. It's not that interesting. Um, and my mom is a therapist in Los Angeles, and so she has a lot of clients in the industry and she said no you know you're not you're not <laughs> she, you are not the, becoming a child actor i said to zach i'm like i love this his mom's a therapist he's an actor that's yeah. unique yeah no no it definitely <laughs> helped for sure Interesting. um i i would not I, I would definitely wouldn't be acting if it wasn't for my mom um but not because she wanted me to get into acting just because like once i was she helped me a lot right um both in like taking me to auditions and in just like you know using her psychological skills to like right. help me with auditions and stuff right, right. um but all the, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so my sister really, really wanted to do it. Um, my mom said no. Um, I was five. I was just going to do whatever my sister did. I didn't really have a dog in the fight. Um, and my sister gave my mom the silent treatment for a week, a whole week. And so finally, my, my sister, my mom was like, okay, fine. Like, I'll take, I'll find you guys some classes. Um, she got a list from one of her clients. I think it was like 15 classes on the list. And only two of them were on Sunday. The rest were on Saturday. So we had, you know, two options. Um, and... One of the classes was like, you know, had all like the parents like biting their fingernails in, in, in the waiting room. And like, it was just a super tense, like nervous kind of energy and just not, not the right vibe. And then the second class was taught by this lady named Connie Barrett, who actually still is my acting coach today. Um, who was my first acting coach, still my acting coach today. And um, I started doing her class for like, and I just loved it. We, my sister and I would go from when I was five to when I was seven, two years every Sunday. I'd miss birthday parties for it. It was like a three hour class super fun we loved it. we would you know we'd make like short films and stuff um and eventually i ended up at a commercial workshop and at the end of the workshop there was a showcase and my mom wrote me like a little oreo jingle um and my commercial agent who the guy who became my commercial agent this guy named jeremy opodi was at the showcase um called asked me to audition for him i did uh and then when i was seven he signed me so i started doing commercial auditions and then a year later, he referred me to my theatrical agent when I was eight um, in the same agency. So all that to say, I never really woke up as like, you know, a five or six year old and was like, and, you know, it wasn't my mom either being like, OK, we're going to try to pursue this. It was right. just like a hobby that turned into something more. Very organic. Very organically. Yeah, I Very feel like organic. there are for sure moms that are like want their kids to become actors. right? Yeah. Through. And I would say most of them are failed actors themselves. Right. Well, they probably put yeah. too much pressure on their There's kids. There's a ton of pressure. Yeah. yeah. Like an it's like the dance moms. Probably you know? an unhealthy thing. Like if you think about I'm it. Sure. Like all you want, like you're, you're living vicariously through your kid. You just want your kid, like your love for your child. Uh, the, the worst story I've heard of that is, and he made a movie out of his Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, yeah. He made that movie Honey Boy about like his dad, just the immense toxicity and pressure he had with, you know, forcing. So it doesn't sound like you were forced at all. You just had a hobby that turned into... And I love that you kept the same acting coach. That's really cool. Yeah. Like, she must get a lot of... Yeah, but I will say, you like, know, you know, the, regardless <laughs> of, like, uh, parent toxicity, parent, like, pressure, it's, it's still, you know, it's... It, I, I would say being a child actor, you know, and I, I, this is not, you know, my parents' fault at all. That's why, that's why I say, like, outside of parent toxicity. Um, you know, I, th I think there's still psychological things that I'm kind of reeling with from being a child actor, just because it completely changes your identity when you're so young, when your identity is yeah. like, you know, when most people are still figuring themselves out. Could you explain it? Could you just expound on that? I think that's very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I just, just for me, like when I was 13, all of a sudden, you know, I had a bunch of Instagram followers and, um, I, and, you know, people were asking for my signature and like, I, I was, I was some kind of celebrity, you know, yeah. just super young and, and, you know, people were calling me Batman and, it was at an age when, you know, when you're 13, nobody knows who they are at 13. Everyone's trying to figure themselves out. 
Um, and then when the show ended, like I remember literally like the day, like the day after the week after the month after it ended, I just, lo I felt like I lost a piece of myself. Um, and to be completely honest, I feel like I'm still trying to search for like, what's going to replace that piece just because wow. like I, I grew up. Ha um, does that make sense? That, that makes sure. a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, that, that, but also hearing that everyone wonders about these things. Yeah. Everyone from the outside wonders what's it like to be Justin Bieber, so to speak, with all that fame that quick, et cetera. Now, you're obviously not Justin Bieber, but you're someone who could relate to that experience in a way of, hey, I'm 13, I have 500,000 followers, right? Like overnight. And how does that affect, you know, those are very formative years of a human being. Exactly. That's very. Yeah. So that's why I asked you to expound on it because that's so hearing when, that when you makes sense just because like because like you said there's a formative there's a formative years those are years when you figure out who you are and i figured out who i was when i had something that was so incredible um so outrageous in a way that was also you know inherently temporary right um and so yeah like i, I would say it's still it's still something that i'm that i'm trying to figure out was your mom like super helpful i mean it sounds like you're still working through this and it probably it sounds like a lot, it takes time to work through this and yeah. figure out who you are despite all this type of stuff. Um, but does your mom help you significantly in this area, being that she's a therapist and she's obviously also a wise woman? Um, honestly, no, not so much. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't really talk about this that, that, that often, to be honest. Really? This, this is something I think about more than I talk about. Interesting. Um, so I appreciate you guys listening. No, that's great. No, yeah. That's, that's awesome, we, by the way. We're I trying to have a real conversation. I appreciate you sharing that and trusting us to share that. That's, yeah. that's really cool information, and yeah, it's vulnerable information. When, truly, when you so. talk about identity and, and, and how now you're kind of searching for, like, what's going to be your, like, replace this piece that was formed of, are you specifically talking about playing Batman, or are you talking about even just being an, uh, an actor or a celebrity? Um, definitely not just playing Batman. Um, that, like, that... That's, I, I don't feel like Batman is a part of my identity at all. <laughs> um, well, I mean, like the whole Gotham experience. I don't, I yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but, but yeah, no, I would say it's, it's, it's being an actor. It's being somebody who, I don't know, you know, like, like especially when I was in New York and I was on the show, I, I couldn't, like, it wasn't, like, incessant, you know, it was never a problem. I, I always enjoyed it. But, like, I, I couldn't leave my apartment and, like, walk on the street or go on the subway without getting recognized once or twice. Like I said, it was never a problem. Um, I always enjoyed it. I always, like, was super thankful to people who recognized me. But that was always a part of who I was, like, that yeah. people might know who I was, um, that I was somewhat known in the world, that I was a, some kind of figure. Um, and that's just, you know, at, at, as it makes sense, like, uh, the show's been off the air for four-ish years, three, three four yeah. years. Um, that's not so much the case anymore. I mean, it happens every once in a while, but, like, right. just, just having that be a part of who you are, that, like, you know, you're famous in some way, you're a celebrity in some way, um, you know, whether it be like a, a B celebrity or not, um, it was a part of who I was. And so just, and, and then obviously that's very tied in and I, I, I don't really know where the line is between that and like the craft of acting and being an actor um, because there's just, there's, there's, they relate so much to each other. Right. Um, there's like, there's two very separate things. There's like being an, an actor and the craft of acting, and there's being a celebrity in right. Hollywood, and those are like very separate things. They're, they're, they are they are like in theory very separate things, but they get very conflated when you're well, on when you're on a show at 13. For sure, a hundred percent. I, I want to ask yeah. one question, right? Go back a little bit. You mentioned how this all happened organically, mm -hmm. and my question to you, that's interesting that I was thinking about when you said that, is can you just be a regular kid and like go to acting school and become great if you start it young enough, or is this like just a natural talent like that just instinctively is there? For me personally, yeah. For anyone, I mean, your perspective. Um, I think that there's, I think just like anything creative, there's, uh, you know, definitely some part of it that's that's you know in your genes, like right. that you just get or you don't get. And I think that a lot of it also has to do with training. Um, I don't, I don't really know what the what the the line is. I actually, I think usually what I say, um, you know what I, what yeah, usually what I tell people, um, I don't really know how true this is. I haven't said this in a while, but I would usually say that it's like. 10% talent, like inherent talent, mm -hmm. um, maybe 30% like training, and then 60% luck. Really? Like you're saying as far as how far you go? As, as, as far as how far you go, yeah. How good you are, it's, you know, I, I, would, I would say that's the ratio, though. Like one, yeah. one part talent, four parts training. You think there's an aspect to this of you getting lucky to a degree? Absolutely. Huge. He's saying it's the biggest piece. Yeah, wow. yeah, no, it's by far the biggest piece. And, and for anybody. I, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody who like And one part talent to four part training. Yeah. 
So I think I don't know. Well, maybe maybe one part. There definitely parts. have been some actors who did not have formal training. Some very big actors, if I'm correct. Maybe I'm not. Yeah. No. No. For sure. Um, for sure. I mean, I, I I personally know actors who don't have a lot of formal training. I don't know. The, honestly, that's that's how it was for me. Those for you. And yeah. also, I have a terrible memory. I have a terrible long term memory. And I started you know training when I was five. <laughs> so I really couldn't tell you. Like I, I don't know. This right, this, this right. is this is stuff that I really don't necessarily know. But I know that I know that it's a muscle. Just like anything else, yeah. yeah. Um, and I know that it's something you have to work. It's such a real sure. craft acting, and I feel like I was very guilty of this my whole life. We're, we're all young. We watch movies. We're like, it's just pretending I could do that. What's so hard? I could do that. And then like you, like I cannot. I'll be start, honest. Yeah, I've gotten much more appreciation for like uh, what actually acting is. Like it's, it's a very much a real skill, and it's it's a rarefied skill that needs. You, like you said, usually training. But like you said, it is very inherent to the human condition. Like I, I mm. so I, I'm going to Stanford now yeah. and I um, just took a class because I'm a psych minor. I just took a class this past quarter where I would go to the nursery school on campus and I would like watch after and interact with the four and five year olds. And, you know, one of their favorite activities is dramatic play where they, you know, pretend to be the mommy and the daddy of the house or, or like they're, you know, explorers going to the moon or whatever, whatever it is. And that's exactly what acting is. It's just like, Letting yourself, it's like getting back to your childhood, like self in just letting yourself play, pretend. That's what it is. It's playing pretend. Playing pretend. That's but, like, but like you have to, but you have to believe yeah. it in the moment. You have, you to, have be- to live it. You have to live. Yeah. You can't, you can't like when I act, the biggest pitfall is being David playing a character. Not, right. you know, not thinking be- about, oh, I have to be a good actor right now. And like a good actor would look this way or getting out you of know, your head, you're saying. Yeah, I get to a certain extent. Yeah, getting out of it's here. almost like being yourself. Like just, you're not just being, being yourself. Just right being now. the character. Yeah, which is you know obviously yeah you well, know you don't act like everyone says that. Acting right, and that there, there's some methods where like I, I know that I was just reading about a method where like if an actor feels something in a scene, for the actor to do a good job, like you need to actually feel that emotion, like fully. Like if he's angry, you are angry. Yeah, and it's it's a real. It is not a pretend you anger. You can get to that space. It's like hypnosis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It is. It is like hypnosis. You you have to delude yourself and like pretend to be in a different land. And that's why auditions are so hard nowadays for me personally, because like, you know, it, it used to be that you go into the room and you have like you have a casting director that and it's, a, it's a new space. It's a new person that you're doing the scene with. Um, and I was always really good at those kinds of auditions. Now all of all auditions are self tape, which basically means that you film them on your phone with your, you know, cousin or your friend or your mom um reading with you and you're in your living room and you're in your slippers and it's like Mm. so hard when you're in such a comfortable environment um with a million takes it's so hard to like forget who you are and to like you know just get like like you said go into that hypnosis state why i would think in a certain way it's easier you could just do a million takes as opposed to there's like less there's less pressure but that's 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 the thing like i don't know i i'm I'm good under pressure if i know i have one chance to do it i'm gonna fucking kill it i love that if i know if i know that i have a million takes i'm i what what what's the rush right why do i need to kill it on the first time right or the second time or the third time and there's there's always something better you can do right to take it again and again yeah but also like for for me i think what it is and i i think that i think that other actors that i've talked to can relate to this um it's the idea of performing. When I'm on a stage or I'm in front of somebody that I don't know, um, it feels like I'm performing and I get some kind of energy, some kind of thing inside of me that puts me into that hypnosis state very right. easily. Um, where when I'm at home and I'm extremely comfortable, I don't feel like I'm performing. I just feel like, you know, my sister knows who I am and like, you know, she's reading with me and like. This right. is actually really fit. I love it's, this. I, I'm a musician and by no means a professional musician. And I've already noticed that writing songs or performing songs anything i do musical is always always <laughs> better you good sorry yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's always better when someone's watching me even one person even an audience of one it, it, it unlocks something in you that allows you to be in the moment i mean what you're saying is, is super interesting I, you know what this goes back to a little bit of a uh, therapy concept and that's like getting back to your inner child yeah like really just like because that's who we really are is our inner child like without all the shit that's happen to us on top of layers all that and layers. you just erase them you just become who you are and yeah I, I think that's i don't know i feel the most for myself for sure at peace when i'm just when i feel like i'm i'm connected to that so i mean it sounds like that's similar and to it's what you're and saying. it's super super difficult to articulate but i think everybody understands the feeling when yeah. when you have those feelings of like you just feel free and you feel unbounded so something super interesting just going back to like finding your inner child um i took a singing class this, this past quarter also and like the first thing that the teacher i loved this teacher um, the first thing that the teacher like said to us is like, he said, he said, take a deep breath and everybody took a, t- t- you guys can do it. Take, take a deep breath. 
Okay, where, where, where did you feel that breath? Like, where, where did you breathe into? Chest. Chest, yeah. right? Yeah. When most people breathe into their chest. Yeah. When we're kids, we breathe into our belly. That's like, when you meditate, they tell you to breathe into your belly because that's the, that's the relaxive state. Um, I don't know the complete science behind it. I don't even know it. if I know how to do it. Yeah, and you, it's really hard to do. It's really, really hard to get back <laughs> oh, to. Oh no, my inner child. So, so what, what you can do later, obviously not right now, but what you can do later is like lie down on, on the floor on your back and just and breathe and you naturally will breathe into your belly when you're lying down because you're relaxed. Huh. Um, and and start, to, start to, when you walk around, start to like focus on breathing in, in your belly. When you sing, I mean, the whole point is that when you sing, you have to breathe into your belly so that you can like have, you know, as much range as possible for any, any note. Um, but that's how we breathe when we're children. And then we get all of these, you know, insecurities and stresses and things that build on top of us. And we start like the, the, the chest. Shallower breathing. The chest breath is a much shallower breath. Yeah. yeah. It's, wow. it's the breath of stress. Interesting. Um, I heard so that, that. that's just like, I don't know. If you want to get back to your inner child for any reason, like just the first step one is breathing through your belly. This, there, there is a thing as art therapy, and I wonder if this is like part of the work that art therapists do, is like there's the play aspect, and then there's the breathing aspect, you know? Mm. What's an art therapist? Oh, just... Uh, I'm not even entirely... I'm, I'm applying to grad schools right now to be a therapist, and I... There is a form of therapy called art therapy. I haven't really looked into it, but apparently they use art and play probably with adults to, mm. to help them heal. It's yeah. probably a lot of it is going back to that inner child. Yeah. So I love the breathing. I'm just wondering... So you were talking about your struggle, right, with becoming, like, finding your identity once Gotham ended. You went to Stanford, right, which is obviously pretty... I think you're current, current? I'm, still, I'm still in Stanford. Still yeah. in Stanford. Stanford. I'm it's graduating in June. It's a prestigious place nice. to go. Why did you decide to go to Stanford versus continuing to pursue an acting career? And, and what do you... Do you see yourself, like, what's your ultimate goal? Is it to go into Hollywood and try to become one of the top actors? Like, where do you stand with that? Ultimately? Yeah, so it's a great question. <laughs> um, nothing that I'm entirely too sure of myself, to be completely honest. A part of me wishes that I did take a gap year, and um, I, I, I didn't. Um, but a part of me wishes that I did take a gap year just so that I could, like, see where acting went, um, you know, right out. Because the, the show ended, and then, like, a few months later, I started Stanford. It was pretty wow. much, it was pretty immediate. Um, and it's really hard to focus on acting when in school. Um, I feel like I've, you know, most of my mind is at school and, you know, a small percentage is like on my career and on, on acting. Um, I want to, I want to act. I, I, that, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, I also want to write. I eventually want to direct. I, I want to tell stories. Like I've, I grew up in this industry, um, you know, literally like m almost my entire life. Yeah. Um, I've been on sets and... It's what I love, and I, I want to. I want to keep doing it. Um, where, where exactly I want to be in the industry is still something that I don't really know. I, I know that I, I want to act. Um, I did a. I worked for Disney um, over the summer in development um, for for comedies, which I really loved. So just kind of like seeing, because I, you know, I, I'd always once once the casting process happens, I know kind of everything. I, I lived, I experienced everything that happens like after that. But before that, you know, when when like. The studio is working with the writers to like make the best script possible and and like doing the casting process and for a bunch of dumb people that are watching this including myself could you just yeah. talk yeah, about man. the basics of acting just like you talk about casting this that I, i'll be honest i'm a novice i don't know anything about this stuff uh -huh. I just watch a movie and i'm like oh cool that was an amazing movie yeah. so could you just share like some of the basic words people are gonna hear you know like you're saying obviously casting is the process of choosing the actors okay um what other words did I use that he? Well, development. You what would it mean, development? So yeah, comedy? so so development. For, so specifically, I, I worked in uh, TV. I was um, Disney has two main um, uh, per production. I don't know why I'm blanking on the word. Companies. Production companies. Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking production agencies. Sorry, this is when my sickness comes in a little bit. Uh, my foggy headedness. Anyway, um, there was two. There's two main production companies. One of them is 20th Century Fox, which you know Disney acquired, and I think 2019, oh. and then. ABC Signature is the other one. Those are the two production companies that make content for Disney um, for all of their platforms from you know, Hulu to Disney Plus to um, all the you know, bunch of platforms there, Freeform, Onyx. Um, anyway, I don't need to go down the whole list. But um, within each of, so, so I worked for 20th and um, in 20th there's development for drama, there's development for comedy, there's animation, and there's series for comedy and drama and then series for drama. And I'll explain all of those things. So um, development um, for comedy and drama is basically the process of getting the kernel of an idea or a pitch, um, some, some, some idea for a show, to finishing shooting the first episode. 
pilot. So that whole pro the pilot, yeah. And sometimes even the second or third episode. Right. Um, but it's it's that process. It's like the very the very early stages. And then after they shoot the the first or second episode, then it moves over to series. And series like looks at the the you know the weekly scripts and gives notes on them, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah who takes over though after development? Series. It's called series. The, the, the department's so called series. So it's development is the stage right before series. Yeah. So you were not stage. writing weekly scripts for shows. No, I mean I wasn't writing. I, I was just working for the studio. You were working for the studio. Okay. I was I was doing you know. Do like, you have a do you have any interest in working like behind the scenes and like well that's what I'm saying I, I loved it um that oh, wow. I I really liked that that side of the business and you know I'm I'm studying economics at Stanford I was I was gonna ask about that like your yeah. degrees are not they don't they don't seem to reflect just someone who's interested in being an artist some of them seem to reflect yeah. like business and and um well I want to be so the the idea going in to Stanford and studying economics was that I I've always been at the same time as being creative and you know acting, I always like loved math. That was always my favorite subject, um, and I didn't want to give that side of myself up. And if I was going to go to a place like Stanford, like they don't have a fan, they're not known for their theater program. Um, like why why study theater just just so I can get the Stanford degree? Like I, I've I've taken theater classes at Stanford, and for anyone watching who you know teaches theater at Stanford, like they're great, but it's just not necessarily what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> just not there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so like, I really enjoy the econ classes and I, and I, I learned them less. I don't have any intention of really using them in my career, like econ or psych. Um, I, I mainly enjoy learning them for the sake of learning them. Like I feel like a more well-rounded human being. I feel like economics teaches me about how society works and psychology teaches me about how human beings work. Sure. And psychology and econ economics have way more connection than people realize. Yeah. Well, right? my, my emphasis in my major is, um, this thing called behavioral economics, which is basically the intersection of psychology. Economics? And I've never, I've never actually read free economics. Is it about behavioral economics? It, it, yeah, it's like an entertaining book about behavioral economics. But you're basically saying is you have a strong interest, obviously, in the business side of this whole thing. No, that's not what I was saying. Um, I mean, the reason I studied economics was because I always felt academically minded, and I didn't want to give that part of myself up. I've, I, I saw college as... Do you guys know who Fred Savage is? I'm not familiar. Why well, so, do I do, you, but I don't you, know you, why you do. I do. <laughs> he, was, he was on The Wonder Years. Um, he was the actor on The Wonder Years. And then he went to Stanford um, right after The Wonder Years finished and studied English. And he is now like a very big sitcom director. Um, I don't really know what he's doing you know, now necessarily. But it turns out we had the same agent. And one of the actors on Gotham, the main actor, Ben McKenzie, um, I was talking to him like when the show was wrapping up. And he said, you know, you should reach out to Fred Savage. Because he knew Fred Savage. He said, you should... Um, reached out to Fred Savage because he also was on a TV show that was on Fox. Um, and then right after it ended, went to Stanford and I'd already gotten into Stanford by then. And so, um, and so I did, turns out we had the same lawyer. I called him and one of the, and I, the same agent and the same lawyer. No, just the same lawyer. Oh, come on. Um, and I called him and one of the things that he said was, cause I said like, you know, because you already had a career was, was going to college like ever a question for you like did you ever think that you just wouldn't do it and he said no I never even thought about that I never even crossed my mind because the way that I saw it was that my career will be for the rest of my life and college is only four years and I will never have another opportunity to go right. to college and so that's yeah. really what can honestly hearing him say that and I, I, I had the same thought but I hadn't really articulated it before I heard that do you feel, like, was, you, uh, do you feel like you lost some momentum though because of the fact that you've kind of left like you were you were you were trending up for sure right you were third, whatever, 14 to 19, you're in a legitimate show, you're on the way up, now you go to Stanford, you kind of like are out of the scene a little bit. Do you lose, there's such a thing yeah, as losing momentum? absolutely. But, you know, like I said, I think it's worth it. Worth I, it. Okay. I'm a very existentially minded person. I think about my life as the big picture a lot of the time. Love that. And um, so honestly, to a fault. <laughs> um, but I sense neurotic Jew. There you go. You figured me out. Um, <laughs> Uh, takes one to know one. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, and so I, yeah, like I said, I, I love my college experience and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, and I, I, I think it's worth it. And I, I have trust in Hashem. I think that, you know, it'll, love that. it'll, it'll work out. Whatever, whatever I'm meant to do will, will happen. I don't really have a very clear, like I said, you know, before, I don't really have a very clear path for I think that's what, really what lies in store after I graduate. But I know what I want. I know what I like to do. I know what I'm good at. And I'm excited to make it work right. in whatever so, way it'll work. And you still have open doors in the acting world. Yeah, obviously. But this was something that you felt was existentially important for you, was to go to Stanford, have this experience, learn these yeah. things. I was going to quip a joke that like, what do you mean? Of course he went to college. Like, he's got Jewish parents. Like, you think, oh, their son's on a TV show? Like, he needs to be a doctor. Like, yeah. let's go. Go to college. <laughs> like, you got to get a job. Um, that was definitely part of it, too. Yeah. <laughs> like, I never, like, I, going to college was never a question. For, like, I always, you know, 
like all of I, I, my, my, my mom's family um, was in the Holocaust. And so we don't have a lot of, you know, people on her side of the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of my aunts and uncles are my mom's like sorority sisters and like college friends. And so like, like, you know, she went to UCLA. So all that to say, I always looked forward to like the, cert, you know, the, the traditional college life, like ever yeah. since I was a baby. Did you make like really good friends in college? Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Lifelong friends for sure. So you, okay, you were so mentioning that you had, that's first of all, very interesting, but you were mentioning that you had, um, you're very interested in the directing, the, the, apologies, the directing side of the business as well. It, but overall, you, your focus is to become an actor or a director? Like if you had to choose. In the, in the short term, um, actor, but I think I, 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 I haven't directed anything. Right. But I've obviously been around many directors. I know how to direct. I know what it would entail. Really? And you think you would know just from having been on the acting side, you feel like you... Yes. I don't know the technical things for sure. I don't know like what... But you, see, you can see. Oh. I, 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 know, I know like the very, very rough like, you know, hmm. meetings of what a certain lens is or not. Um, and I, there would definitely be a learning curve there. But in terms of like directing actors, I think that that would be honestly like, I think I'd be amazing at that. Oh, wow. That's awesome. No, I've, I've done it in the, like with friends, like, you know, at school. And I, I've, I've always, I've, I've always like felt very fulfilled. I saw you were, you have an acting project that came out pretty recently, didn't you? You were in a movie. Yeah. Um, well, I have a couple of shorts coming out in the next few months. Um, I was in another movie that I'm I shot not, over the spring. That's not out yet. But it's on your Instagram. I, I don't know which one. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, no, nothing that came out super recently. I, the last thing that came out of mine was a movie called The Birthday Cake with Ewan that's McGregor. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is that not, that's not so recent? Uh, it came out a year and a half ago. Okay. A little off. But okay, but that was, so that was definitely like, was that the biggest thing you'd done post Gotham in the acting? Uh, probably, yeah. Okay. What was it like getting on? Was The Office your first big thing, like show to be acting on? No. What was before that? Uh, you, you had a main. Well, The Office role. didn't really seem that the big. The Office was before Gotham. No, he, he had the main, the show, the show of Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you talk about that for a second? I was on a show called <laughs> Touch yes. when I was okay. 10 to 12. I apologize. So you, you were close with Kiefer? Yeah. At a point? Are you still? No, not, not necessarily. You know, Kiefer Sutherland is like the number one dude in the Orthodox community in, in 24 New York. was watched by every yeshiva guy. Are you, ever. Really? Are you familiar yeah. with that? I didn't, I didn't know that. 24 is the ultimate yeshiva guy show. That is the show that's on their iPhones when they're not, like in still? Like high school. To this day? Oh, probably not to this day. I mean, it was Prison Break know. at 24. It started with 24, <laughs> yeah. Jack yeah. Bauer. I mean, come on. Yeah. And then it went to Prison Break. What's his name? Uh, Michael. Uh, whatever it is. What's yeah. his actor's name? Yeah, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Whatever. Wait, was, was uh, Touch with pre or post 24? Post. Right, like just after 24 just after. ended. Oh. Yeah. Oh, what? You shot with him right after 24 ended? It was like, it was like a year after 24. Season ended. 8. Right. That eight season. I was, yeah. But then 24 came back. They, That's right, yeah, 24 came back. They had, they had, they had a reboot. When things oh, make a ton of money, they usually come yeah. back. Come back, yeah, I especially on Fox. Do, I <laughs> hate when they do that, by the way. When they make like, uh, actually the show that, the, the movie that just came out was the greatest sequel I've seen in years. Uh, Top Gun. That was oh, yeah. fantastic. And I feel like most sequels, they just, like, uh, what's it called? Uh, Fast and Furious, they gotta just stop. I don't care how much money they're making. They're just, <laughs> there's, I feel like they're just butchering someone it. Someone said point. that like, after the, the nuclear apocalypse, the only thing that'll still be left over is cockroaches and Fast and Furious movies. <laughs> they're gonna continue to make them. It's like insane at this point. I'm like, not enough. Um, how, many, how many are we at now? 11? <laughs> yeah, I, think so. I stopped. After six, I was like, nah, I'm done. Like, it's over. Yeah. You know? But apparently, the movie, they should change the movies to Vin Diesel, vroom, vroom. Like, yeah. it's, it's, um, family. Family. <laughs> family, family. Second, so you, by the way, so you mentioned that actually interesting. You mentioned you know that you you're, you have confidence in you know Hashem and God about where your career is going to go and where your life's going to go, and uh, you actually mentioned that you see life in a very full existential way, which is very interesting because I, I kind of feel like I do as well. Um, but I was I was curious, like you grew up in what type of religious home? Like I grew up in like the traditional right wing Ashkenazi like home, like pretty yeshiva, you know what I'm saying? Based when when you you grew up from Orthodox. Orthodox, yeah, modern Orthodox. Modern Orthodox. You guys are Sephardi. I mean, I'm Sephardic. Sephardic. Did you grow up but, in LA? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Grew up 20 minutes from here in an area called Beverlywood. So there's, I don't know if you, how much you guys know about like the Jewish community in LA, but there's two, there's two major communities. One in La Brea, which is like pretty from, mm-hmm. um, and pretty pretty Orthodox. And then there's a modern Orthodox community in Beverlywood, which is where I grew up. So a little bit further left than, um, than like typical yeshiva, like right wing. Okay. Um, right. Type of. Do you mind telling us a little bit like how you grew, like what was Judaism like in your family and? It was it was a huge part of my family. I mean, yeah, like I said, I I went to modern Orthodox school my entire life. Um, I went to you know shul every Saturday. Um, 
growing up. My my dad still like you know so so when I was when I was probably like thirteen or fourteen, my mom and then pretty soon after my sister stopped really like keeping Shabbat to the T. Um, and so I kind of followed suit a little bit after that. Um, this was what age? I'm sorry. When I was like 13, 14. Yeah. Um, but my dad is still very, very religious um, in oh, every wow. sense of the word. Like he, he goes to, you know, Minion at like 6 a.m. every morning. Really? Yeah. And he's a doctor, so he'll go before work. Wow. Um, and, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I am Sephardic. Both my parents are Sephardic. I'm fully Sephardic. But we grew up in a mainly Ashkenaz community. So like I always prayed Ashkenaz and... Uh, right. right. Yeah. So, like, I, I be, I'm like on a Yeah, like, whitewashed. Oh man. Yeah. I, I am whitewashed, but what, I, am, but I am Sephardic. What kind of uh, Moroccan or Persian or what, what kind of Sephardic? My dad's Tunisian. Oh, wow. Tunisian French, and cool. my mom is Greek. Okay. So that's that's why I'm white. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, what yeah, it is. yeah. Okay. That's what I was wondering. I asked you if you're a Sephardi. I thought like maybe that's a stupid question, and you were gonna be like, dude, get out of it. But your last name is obviously yeah, um, a Sephardi name. Um, very, was, very was that ever like a worry you had? I, again, I don't know how, where you were holding by Shabbos when you, or Shabbat when you started um, with Gotham, but was, there, was that ever an issue of like, what if there's a shoot on a, on, on a Saturday? Yeah. Um, well, I remember like the first time that was ever an issue was I was doing, I was a guest star on Major Crimes. I don't know if you ever heard of Major Crimes. Yeah, I've heard of Major Crimes. It, it, was, it was a spinoff of some, I think it was a spinoff of Law and Order. I forget. I think so. Yeah. Um, something like that. And they wanted to shoot on Rosh Hashanah, Air Rosh Hashanah. Um, and... You know, I booked it, obviously, like, you know, whenever you book something, it's, like, super exciting. And I told my agent, like, I can't, I can't do it, you know. Sa- San- Sandy Koufax didn't play on Yom Kippur. Like, <laughs> yeah. I can't. This is your Sandy Koufax Ex- moment. Exactly. Um, <laughs> huge. And they actually moved it. They moved it for me. They um, moved it for you? They moved the night, yeah. What instead, about, Sa- what about Instead on, of getting a new actor. What about on Shabbos? Like, I, I mean, I'm sure you've had shoots that have had that, but on Shabbos, right? Yeah, I've shot on, I've shot on like, Friday night before. Right. Um, for the most part, never on Saturday. Right. Um, but I, I have I have shot on Shabbat before. Like like I said, like I, I don't really follow Shabbat to the T. I'm not extremely religious. I'm much more spiritually and culturally Jewish than anything yeah. else. Um, but I grew up very religious. So like I know what it's you know what it, what it means to right. be Orthodox. Yeah, I was going to ask you when we were talking initially. Uh, you had mentioned that like you're you still keep very close tabs, so to speak, on the you know with the Orthodox community and everything. Like currently, how, like what's your involvement? Like just all your friends are involved? Like is there specific things you're involved in? Yeah, so like all of my best friends from home um, all like pretty much universally go to YU. So oh. so whenever I go to New York, like I stay in the Heights and like I- That's I, amazing. Um, so like I feel very connected to it mainly through my friends and my dad these days. Um, I don't really go to Shul anymore, but I, go, I you know, I go to like, I have Shabbat dinner with my family every, every Friday. Right. Um, That's really nice. So, you know, kind of the basics, I would say. Shabbat I'm, dinner is the shit. It's, it's the best. Yeah, that was going to say, best. no matter who you are, if you don't like Shabbat dinner Friday night, there's just something wrong with and you. And if you're yeah, watching yeah, this yeah, and yeah. you've never had a Shabbat dinner, go have a Shabbat dinner. It's yeah. the yeah. shit. <laughs> I actually just watched something interesting, by the way, from Dennis Prager, who you don't have to agree with or not. It's not the point. But he said the punishment for not keeping Shabbat, he was referring to like Friday night and everything, is just that you miss Shabbat. Like that, <laughs> that's the punishment. Like who cares yeah. about anything else? Like yeah. why would you not no, want Shabbat's, that in your life? Shabbat's yeah. dope. <laughs> Maybe like taking chulin out of the pot with all of the halachot is like not so much fun like yeah, keeping full halachot it's less fun <laughs> Friday night chulin also are you a Friday night chulin guy? Uh, Saturday day chulin guy no. so you, you I, got, I, I would always get it at shul when I, I would go to like the teen minion <laughs> and, and like my rabbi from like my school would always have chulin for us like after we finished it was the best no David you have to understand one thing of course by day you have chulin Shabbat day I'm talking yeah. about there's a thing in, in like the right wing to, do, to steal chulin on Friday night like, like take it out of the pot early. Take it out of the pot. Oh, for yeah. sure. But there's a there's a vibe to having chalent on a Friday night. I promise you. You gotta just try there's it. There's a vibe. Do you come to New York often? And not super often, but like not every once in a while. Right. I'll okay. hit you up when I'm there. Right. I was gonna say the next time we're gonna go out, we're gonna have a good time. Yeah. Friday night. I'm gonna introduse you to the Friday night. <laughs> Zach is in the West Side. We hang out. <laughs> Friday night chalent move. It's it's yeah. a thing. Amazing. Yeah. It's a little vibe. I can't wait. Yeah, um, I, I see in your Instagram. You are you do hang out in New York a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, I have a lot of friends there, and if I if I ever have a reason to go to New York, I'll take it because I, I I love New York. And, point I, and blank, I lived there for five point years. Point blank range. New York, LA, you can only live in one city for the rest of your life. You can't visit other one. Like, where are you picking? For the rest of my life? Yeah, I know. It's kind of a question. Away. The rest of my sure. life, LA, for sure. Yeah, I, uh, because I don't want to raise, I don't well, raise my family, your family. Okay, sorry. let's say you can move your family to New York. I can, family no, comes with you. No, no, no. Still, LA. I don't sure. want to raise my family in New York when I'm a dad. Oh, yeah. I don't disagree with you there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's no, a horrible no, no. place to raise like, kids. I, I, I would love to, if I, had a, if I had a reason to live in New York, like post-college, I would take it in a heartbeat. Because I think like, yeah. you know, in your, when you're in your early 20s, like New York is the shit. It's, it's definitely yeah, I know. Why? Like, well, yeah, dude. a place to be. It's the most Absolutely. romantic place to live, like with a capital R romantic I'm going to be honest, I feel like to a degree, 
I missed out on my young teens in New York City. Like, I like would, 20s, really your 20s. My 20s, that's what I meant. Yeah, in my yeah. 20s, not young teens, what am I saying? Correct. Young 20s, where now I look back and I'm like, why was I not just spending months and months in the city every night just yeah. vibing? I don't know what the hell happened, where I was, whatever. Yeah, our background, <laughs> it, it excuses it. There's too much dysfunction going on in my brain. But yeah. now I look back and I'm like, going there, I'm like, why wasn't I in the village every single night? Yeah. As like, you know. Where do you 20? like to hang out when you're in, when you're in the city? Um, well, like I said, my friends stay in the in the Heights, so I, I spend some right. time there. But um, honestly, I usually just go to see friends because like it, I, I I'm not I don't feel like a tourist when I'm there because I because I live there. Because you live so there first, right? You're like yeah. a New York, you are part. So of I feel New I feel, I definitely feel New Yorker. Um, Where did I, you say you lived I feel there? That again? Time. Um, I lived in Brooklyn Heights for six months, and then the the other four and a half years I was on the Upper West Side. In oh, you places. were on the Upper West Side. Yeah, uh, got it. Okay. I was on 72nd and Central Park West for a few months, sure. and then I was on 70th in Amsterdam for a couple of years. Got it. And then 70th the Upper West Side, side is years. so Jewish. I swear, I go, walk around there, and like every single oh, person fantastic. you see is like, unless they're like, like clearly not Jew, you're like, oh, that's a Jew. That's a Jew. Yeah, like, yeah. Everyone looks like Larry David there. Time it's, out. Talk yeah. to me. Restaurants. Which restaurants are? Are Amsterdam you? Burger. Oh, you're an Amsterdam Burger. Guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Say less. I love it. That's my shit. I love it. It's so expensive, but it's so good. The yam fritters. Yeah. I'm trying to. I've, I've never eaten that. Not, not a yam fritter guy. I'm not a yam fritter guy. By the way, right now. <laughs> what like, is a yam fritter? <laughs> just try it, man. It's so good. When was the last time you were there? How long ago were you? Fun to say. You're getting Amsterdam Burger? Yeah. Yeah. When was the last time you were at Amsterdam Burger? When was the last time I was at Amsterdam Burger? We're talking years? These uh, are the hard hitting questions we're, people want. To know. We're talking like last summer, is what we're talking. Okay, I got hit. I'll be honest. I'm a mocha burger. Uh, oh, mocha burger's good. Yeah, I, I, that's just the, the go to mocha burger, boof and bun. Just yeah. like, are you an Izzy's guy? What's uh, I like Izzy's. What's what's that? What's that like really nice steakhouse place on like 42nd? I want to say La Marais. La Marais. La Marais. Yeah. La, yeah. yeah La Marais is awesome. Yeah. yeah. But you got. I mean. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta deserve La Marais. It's like, a, it's like a, it's like a, a glass of like champagne. Sure, you know, you, know where you gotta you, be celebrating. You know where La we gotta go. There's this Chabad place. I'm trying to remember what the hell it's called. Where you Me. say it's, you say it's of our Torah, and you, you get a free, uh, you get a free dessert. Uh, dessert. I think it's meat. You know what it is? Do they judge you on the quality of the Dar Torah? No, not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> it can but be a terrible I, Yeah, you get a really bad dessert. It's a Chabad place. I'm blinking. It's on the Upper West Side. I'm pretty sure. Oh, it's amazing. Forgetting. You bring your own alcohol there. It's uh, like a total for bringing, lit. but like it's a hilarious lit. place. Shulam knows what I'm talking about. I love the concept. What? Yeah. No, no, Carb no, no, you have Carbone? it wrong. No, 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 you have it wrong. I live in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, so <laughs> sure. I'm like, I'm in with the Chabad crowd. Let's go. I need to go to that restaurant and say the. the yeah, by the, the way, we brought our own Jamie here. We're moving quickly this podcast, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So it's like three months he's ago. He's not a Jamie though, because he's not looking stuff up. No, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we're we're moving very very quickly and like. Um, no, thank God. Things have been, things have been good. Uh, there is something I, I really wanted Please. to bring up. This is just because we haven't brought it up yet. And it was something I saw on your page that it doesn't fit with the, uh, it, it fits with acting, but it's a specific I'm world in, that you kind of enter. I'm so curious what you're talking about right now. You have been in a couple of music videos with like Trippy Red. Oh yeah. And like multiple times with Trippy Red and, and Ian Dior. Yeah. Like how, I want to know how that happened. Who Trippy Red is? And I don't know who that is. So Tri you don't know who that is? No, I'm, I'm going to let, dude, Dave, you got to go, <laughs> go home and listen to Dark Link. Go Devil home right and listen. Now. Does everyone know who this is? In my Count my guap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Back in my world, does everyone know who this is? No, oh, no. Okay, no. so I'm saying for our audience that doesn't know who it is, okay. say who this is. <laughs> Trippy Red is one of the biggest rappers. like mumble rappers that came out of this, the SoundCloud rappers. Like, yeah, I think mumble rap is is an offensive term. <laughs> SoundCloud rappers. SoundCloud. Is Honestly, the yeah, SoundCloud's term. better. He's really. I think he might be like the, him or, or or not. What's his name? Um, Uzi. No, Uzi's not really a SoundCloud Cardi? rapper. Cardi. Him or Cardi? No, are probably no, they're all SoundCloud big. rappers. I would say. Is this like is Takashi Uzi? Takashi Six Nine or nothing? No, no. no. Kashi Fuck that guy. is trash. Okay, that Fuck deal? that guy. <laughs> also, uh, yeah, honestly, he's not trash. He makes some good music, but he's trashy, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's really trashy. That guy's an interesting character. Holy shit. For sure. He's very yeah. New York. I'm sure you know something about him. I just see some of his stuff, and I'm like, this guy is like a multimillionaire, obviously, but, whatever. Yeah. I, I love, I get so hype off, like, when, when New York rappers make, like, New York, like, they shut down a city block, and the whole music video is just, like, like people on top of cars, just, like, yeah. chilling in the, like, I you love You ever seen that, that baby, you know who Baby Keem is? Of course. Yeah, so he he has a he has a song called Mosh Pit. It's a pretty short song, and the entire music video is him moshing with a bunch of Hasidic Jews. No, on, in like Crown Heights. Well, we're getting Baby Keem on the pod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, tell me like how so, did, so, how yeah, did that so long, connect? I mean, it's very simple. Sure. Um, one of my best friends, who I actually met through Michael Gruen, um, is this guy named Mooch. Yeah. And I, Mooch is a music video director, and he lives right around here, and he just puts me in his videos when he can. 
just because he but, knows he knows but, that we but, both and then but enjoy like did it. Trippy Red like like you from the first video and was like yeah get him again for the next one? No, it's literally just Mooch just directing. Mooch directed the video, so he has like creative say. You know, is that something you would like to do more of, like music videos? I mean, that's not where I see my career going. <laughs> no, not your you career. Know? Just like, would you like it's, to do it's, more? It's then? just that I I'm a massive massive rap fan. So from for like the inner kid in me, like what I love every it. Jewish kid love loves movie. rap. What it's, is that? I like we do. all love rap. Who are your favorites? Like Drake, I know it's super basic to say, but I'm no, no, Drake's Drake. awesome. Drake's I just awesome. want to get your style. I just want to see yeah. what you like. Who else? I mean, like honestly, like the most basic rappers is who I like. Drake, Future, um, like I don't know, he who shall not be named anymore. Oof, <laughs> that's a good. Way of, that's good. It's a good way of putting. He's it kind of Voldemort these days. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I like that. It's great. Um, yeah, I don't know, like the the regulars. But then you, Travis, then you like the Travis, Travis, even though he killed eight people. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, he's kind of back. He bounced back. Yeah, which is, I don't know how I feel about that. Welcome though. to America. You can have a, you can. The thing is, be, though, like, I don't think it's necessarily his fault. I just really, like, I, I had no opinion on the, on the matter until he came out. I don't know if you saw that interview that he did, like, right after it happened, know. where he was basically, apo like, apologizing. But it was so clear that he had, like, a two-line script that was given to him by his lawyers that was, like, I'm very sorry that this happened, but I feel no responsibility. Who's this? You know, Who are we talking about? Basically, Travis, Travis Scott, Scott one of had, had a massive um, uh, festival in Houston. Astroworld. Astroworld. In, I think, at the end of, about a year ago. I remember that someone died. Is that possible? I'm totally missing. Many eight, people eight died. Eight kids died. Oh, I remember like, this. Eight, like, people between the age of, like, 14 and 21. Holy shit. Yeah. So why did they die again? What happened? Stampede? St yeah, because these concerts are wild. Well, why crazy is it crazy mosh pits? Because, well, I mean. They suffocated. No, he's why saying, why is it his fault? Because he, he oh. could have seen... Well, I, mean, I don't know. What do I mean, you think? I, I, don't, I don't really know the details of it, but like there were definitely people trying to like, there were, you know, if you have like thousands of people in, in, a, in a crowd, like tripping over each other and like literally suffocating, you know, to the point where eight people are going to die. Um, stop the concert, you're saying. You should, yeah, you should, should, should stop the concert. And it's not that, it's like not clear whether or not he knew what was happening while he was right. on stage, because he's on stage, you know, he's focusing on performing. But, yeah, right. but apparently there were only three people that were, that were like had the power to stop to stop the concert and he was one of them and people were undoubtedly trying to get his attention you know people were like climbing up on like the camera booths like trying to be like hey like you know we're, we're literally dying down here right. you, like you have to do something and people like the security guards were just like pushing them down right um, it's not giving so like it, it's unclear how much of that that's why i said like i don't really I, I didn't blame him before i saw like the inner like i just didn't seem like he was remorseful it seemed like right. if he was more sorry that it happened than like for his responsibility feeling, in it or, like or, he, he didn't feel bad right exactly right. feeling you know? bad that like come out there and like i mean if he it, felt he felt bad that his career was like maybe over right. instead of we like feeling like a, bad a, that a eight Con kids died i mean we we you have like I, a kanye I, travis track come out just like all the problematic rappers and the baby because he's like homophobic yeah. just put them all in one song I was just, yeah. yeah i mean if that happened at something i did or whatever obviously most most people i think would like literally be like devastated just yeah. like crying like the, at their event eight people died that's yeah. like eight of was, your fans who came yeah, because whatever. they love you yeah, yeah like yeah. human life whatever and, and it, apparently like him and drake both went to like a dave and buster's after party like right after it happened and apparently like so they say that the news was already out by the time they were like at the after party so they were, just they, they were still partying like once they knew people died at the that's concert absurd. they're like that's yeah. like that it's like those things like like was it his fault that people died probably not but, but like, was like was his reaction appropriate i don't think so right no. right no you know who had the worst apology of all time hands down in my opinion who um that recently happened you know who liver king is <laughs> liver king i don't know who liver that oh, had okay. to have been the most hilarious apology i've ever seen that is life. a it's a google rabbit hole for you to go down but he was like a huge 2.4 million followers so, on instagram you're making fun of me that i don't know whoever the hell you just mentioned <laughs> <laughs> yeah. liver king is a decently big deal at this point for sure um no just he yeah he was a he was a influencer for like but he was big personality and he believed like he, in eating raw liver and he had this crazy body like i've never seen oh i, did, I, did, I have seen this okay yeah, 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 I, saw, yeah. I saw the scandal yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. Everyone yeah. in the world, Joe Rogan had been saying for like months, like, dude's taking so much steroids. Steroids. And he was like, no, I'm not. And that's like, yeah, no shit. He was taking 12 grand of steroids a year. Yeah, yeah, because the emails leaked, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was his apology? Why was it bad? No, he literally like got into like a big chair, like in front of his, I don't know how to be explaining his house, still wearing no fucking shirt, still no shirt, still just like chilling there with his cap backwards like he always does. And like, you could tell it was the most BS apology of all time. Like saying about how he did all this for everyone else because he has low self-esteem and this generation suffering from low self-esteem, blah, blah, blah. Literally the next morning, he's in like an ice bath, like eating liver and just like, uh, he's sitting there, it, like yeah. right back at it. And by the way, credit to him. And still taking steroids. Credit, yeah, for sure. <laughs> credit to him. And still going on with the same act. Like just because I was taking steroids doesn't mean this isn't a good lifestyle to live and the things I'm promoting aren't yeah, good. Yeah. And, and credit to him. He has not gotten canceled in any way. 
And I think partially that's because of everyone knows he's a total act like all along. Right. And like part of that, he's just like humorous to follow always. So like he's still humorous. He's so yeah. Like, yeah. It didn't really make a difference. The question is, can we get the Veed Mazus to say something cancelable right here on the pod because we're looking for controversy. That's a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I, I, but I was going to say, What are your like, thoughts on the Middle East? <laughs> oh, perfect. That's where I would hope that we would go. Um, I, like, I, I, don't, I don't think you can really get cancelled nowadays unless you offend someone and he just lied. So, you know, well, it's pretty that's easy a good to offend point. people though at this point. No, but that's a good point. He, well, didn't, he didn't offend anyone. He didn't say anything mean. He just lied. Was, was saying, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's why he didn't get cancelled. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. That's... Okay. I, but yeah, that's that a, might be it. That's a hilarious thing that you get, you're quicker to get canceled if you offend someone than for lying outright. He told, like, that's a pretty bad, like. No, 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 for sure. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I think right, that's yeah. how the world works. That's how cancellation works, at least nowadays. Right. But I also, I also do think that people are not getting canceled as easily anymore. I feel like we're over the, the hill of, like, mm -hmm. ultra PC culture. I feel like people don't really want to see it as much anymore. Right. I hear that. Why do you think that happens? How did, how did, that, hill, how did that tie turn a little bit? I don't know. I think I think mo like most things in the world, like it's a, it's a pendulum, and we swung like a little too far in one direction, and we're going back. You back know, right? And you, people should. There now, hopefully, we get to a place where the people who really should be canceled, and right. there are plenty right. of those people in Hollywood and, and beyond, they'll get canceled, and mm -hmm. everyone else, will, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I think we actually discussed on the Gruen podcast. We did discuss. We had a conversation around how to handle people. Yeah, and there could be meaning. You know, different. There's sides. always there's always discussion yeah. to be had on how to handle yeah. like. The Kanye's Whether, of the world and people saying problematic things, but yeah, and that's super interesting because, like, you know, I when that when that when all that first started happening, I was like very much like I, I'm still gonna listen to I was team like I'm still gonna listen to Kanye's music like I right. don't agree with him as a person. Like graduation but, still but, slaps exactly, but like I I pride myself on being able to separate the artist from the art, um, and like I still read Dr. Seuss even though he was you know a, a raging anti-Japanese racist, and yeah. I still listen to he Michael was, Jackson. I don't even know. What was the doctor? I remember him getting canceled. What happened? Uh, something, something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, he, he was racist, and yeah. uh, I forget exactly what he did or what he said, but, um, and Michael Jackson probably, you know, was a probably. pretty bad pedophile, but, yeah. you know, his music is also pretty good. So, like, <laughs> alleged, yeah. alleged, uh, alleged, 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 No, I, I know, but uh, <laughs> Dave, Dave Chappelle, my hands-down favorite comic of all time, um, said something like he uses the word allegedly like around michael jackson he's like oh no around oj simpson he's like oj simpson who by the way allegedly killed his wife it's not for sure no let's say you know like he made like a whole you know his yeah. whole you know i don't know if you saw when he came back and he did his netflix special the, the first time he was out of hollywood for like 10 years yeah yeah, yeah. And to me that's one of the greatest specials i've ever seen hands down who well, ari shafir by the way just had an amazing special called jew i don't know if you saw i it. haven't seen it no. do you know who ari shafir is, is it on netflix? no it. i, I don't Big stand-up comedian, and he just put out a special, and it, the entire special is about growing up Orthodox. Oh, wow. And he gets into it. Like, he's quoting Gemaras. Like, wow. this guy, it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see, as someone come from that world, they're like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of humor to be mined yeah, no, for from sure. this community. I, for wonder, sure. I wonder if, by the way, other people appreciated the humor as much as we did, or thought, found it as funny Jew as we did. did very well. Huh? Jew did that, that special, did very, very well. Yeah, it did. I think people... It's called Jew. Yeah, it's called Jew. I Netflix. think that... There's a it's, real... No, it's not even on Netflix. It's on YouTube. It's free. Oh, okay. Bet. He has like a whole thing of like putting out his content for free because he doesn't want anyone controlling him or, yeah. or, or just like, I don't know, to promote artists for like because they're good and like not be... I don't know how to explain it. He has a whole thing of just support artists. Like he has his link. You could send the money if you want to send yeah. the money. He has yeah. his Venmo on there. Like no yeah. pressure, nothing. If you felt that you got enjoyment after I put in five years of work and you enjoyed my 90 minutes yeah. to make your evening good... Throw me ten bucks. That type. Yeah, of, I mean that's do. that sounds great. It doesn't. It's not very practical. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, he's probably be making way less money than he would if he had enough to steal. But like, sure. Yeah, great. Um, I, actually, I'm I curious because I'm sure you've done plenty of interviews in your life, and um, just like especially when you're on Gotham, like, do do people ever bring up the the the, the Judaism side of you, or, or you don't? Every, get I'm only Jews do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jews and you Jewish? You yeah. Jewish? Yeah. <laughs> What's the actual? Okay, hold on. What is the anti-Semitic situation like? Has that ever gotten in the way of your acting, or totally not? Um, uh, for the most part, no, never at all. Not even a little bit. Um, I, you know, I grew up in LA in the 21st century. Like, right. it's it's, I, I'm very lucky. Um, you know, however, when I first booked Gotham, um, they, I won't name names, obviously, um, but. So they, they sent me the offer. I'd gotten the job. And then they'd never released it on deadline for months. Um, and then I found out from my agents that they were still casting people in 
or they were, they were still looking for the role for you know Bruce Wayne's in Chicago and in, in Texas, which is markets that they hadn't gone to yet. Um, and I found out that the creatives really loved me. Most um, it was a Warner Brothers produced show, so the Warner Brothers executives really loved me, um, and most of the Fox executives really loved me. There was one person who said that I looked too Jewy to be Bruce Wayne, and eventually he was you know overridden, but. I almost didn't get Gotham basically wow. because I had curly hair, which is why my hair is straight in the show. Oh, I, that's, the, the, I the saw that. How do they make your hair straight? Like whatever, every episode? Yeah. Keratin. It's like this thing that you can get. It's like Brazilian. Um, it's like every, every month I would like go in and get this like product in my hair that would just like literally make it straight. Did you like the way it looked? Like do you ever like do it? Actually, I remember, by the way, I, I saw it. I, you, it looks pretty, it looks natural totally. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. Do, you ever, do you ever mess around I mean, with it like, I, would, I would spend 45 minutes in the hair chair every, every day. Wow. Every day? Every day I shot, yeah. That's annoying. How long did it last? Does, does the keratin last? The keratin lasted a month, but even with the keratin, I would still need 45 minutes for them to like put all the product in. And, like, wow. Because they would, they would still like, hair, they, would, they would blow dry it, they'd flat iron it, they'd put product in it. 45 Whoa. minutes of Jew control, just like. Literally. <laughs> Crazy. Literally. Iron the Jew out. Damn. That's unbelievable. What did you, um, do you have a, uh, I would, yeah, go ahead. I'm just <laughs> wondering, do you know how many people you beat out? To play? I don't have a number, Batman? but it definitely was a nationwide search. And I think they looked in London too. But we're looking at, you beat out thousands of people. Probably, yeah. Well, that's just the idea amazing. that you were Bruce Wayne is insane. <laughs> that's crazy to me. I, I don't know. How, like, you and Christian I'll, Bale have something in common. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> how many, I assume while you were doing I want to play Moses next. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> First of all, you would play Moses. Because he played Moses. Christian Bale? Yeah. What are you talking about? What movie? In a movie called Exodus. I forget who directed it. It's a terrible oh. movie. No one talked about it. Oh, yeah. He, that's, I've never he played it. Moses, yeah. Wow. It was the Exodus story. You look, actually look, look Middle, like Middle Eastern. Like you could I am. Play, you, are, right, you are Middle Eastern. Do you have actors who are big mentors to you in the industry that you're close with? That I'm close with? No, not really. Mm, not really. Have you met a lot no. of big actors, I assume, throughout this? Uh, yeah, culture? some. Like, um, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith was on the show. So, right. um, so like, right. her and Will Smith invited me to do a couple table reads with them. And you know, I, I got to meet Will Smith, the whole family. Did he slap you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> now you served that one up. And by the way, that's the easiest joke to make of all time. It is. So. It is a very easy joke. He was actually incredibly kind. Um, we talked about like he seems generally yeah, a good. He dude. seems like generally he's, he's, a great, he's emotional. He was, by the he way, he great seems dude. like a sensitive guy, yeah. which is what made that happen, probably. Yeah. Like I mean, that's obviously being a little too sensitive. You got to be able to control yeah. yourself, but. <laughs> Not too sensitive. You it was insane able- that that happened. What? I said it was insane that that happened. I, I, it still doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I had the same reaction I think most people did, which is I thought it was scripted. Really? I, 100%. I was watching a lot. I thought it was scripted. To walk up there on stage. Yes. And- I thought it was like a, a thing. Because, that because the Oscars have like been lo- losing viewership yes. recently. Yes. And they needed to like spice yes. it up. Because it was too weird. of a good Sometimes theory. something that's too weird to happen, you're just like. It's you're super on- weird. You're it's like, super weird. It's and it hasn't ruined his career at all. No? no, no, no. He's still making he's movies. He's too big, man. He's too, he, he was. I think for many years he was the most bankable person in Hollywood. Really? Like, there's a list that the execs have. Like, who is the most? Like, it was him, and then DiCaprio. Like, he wow. was number one. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Like, you it, put him it, in a movie that sad movie's that, like, doing. The well. Rock is probably like in the top five. Of that that is kind of sad because really? the, the Rock, Rock a good actor. No, I don't think so. <laughs> he plays the Rock in <laughs> every freaking movie. So what's the answer? Why is he? Because people like the Rock. He's very, first of all, he's nice. He's charismatic, yeah. He's charismatic. He has a personality. He makes, yeah. I mean, if you watch his like videos on Instagram, he just like smiles into the camera and like talks about bullshit for three minutes and like <laughs> it makes you, it makes, it makes you like him even though he's yeah. not saying anything of, of importance. <laughs> wow. Hot takes here from TV. I love that. Sorry. So that's there, is listen, there, like if The Rock, if you, if you watch this, you're great. Black Adam was awesome. <laughs> Dwayne, we are so sorry. <laughs> no, but The Rock, they actually say, by the way, they say he's a a, a genuinely kind person. Oh, I'm sure. I'm yeah, sure. No, we're, we're talking about acting skills. I, I understand, yeah. but I'm saying no. But for a, I'm yeah. just saying for a guy of that magnitude, there's so many of these guys are dicks. Let's just be yeah. honest. Yeah. They're not. They're not nice people. They're rude. The fame has gotten to them. I think to be in that position and be a, actually a genuinely nice person is is, is a yeah. No, it's an amazing honestly, thing. I don't think yeah. people should take that for granted. I think that's no, they should not. You know, we, we a lot of times we say, oh, I'm not going to give you a compliment for being just a regularly nice guy, and the answer is no. I will give you a, a guy like yeah. that that compliment. Um, let me ask you this. A lot of the reason why I started this whole podcast, um, and I think Zach would agree, but for sure for me, um, is that like I have this vision. I was always been an out of the box guy, a nonconformist guy, and I don't like when people tell me something can't be done. Like I don't even want to hear that. And oh, yeah. kind of a mind for my own. And 
I think a lot of people in the from world, especially at least where I grew up, this is a general generalization probably, but for the most part, um, are told that because they're from, they have to stay in this box and mm -hmm. you know, they can't do A, they can't do B, they for sure can't be an actor, da 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 da. Do you feel that that's true? Like, are you able to be a firm guy and still be an actor? Like, yeah, let's I want say you were 100%. I, I don't like, want you just full... to give me the PC answer, like, oh, yeah, of course you can. I, I want to know honestly. Can you be from, like, traditionally from and still pursue a career as a director or be, in, be an actor, be a director? Yeah, no, you can do it. It would be really hard and you're going to have to make sacrifices and you're going to face a lot of really difficult decisions very early on in the process. And eventually you'll, you know, hopefully gain enough notoriety and credibility and people will know you where you can, like, you know, call your own shots. But at the beginning, it will be very difficult to do it. Much You're going to have a lot more roadblocks than other people, um, mainly just because of, like, you know, shooting on Shabbat and eating kosher and, um, yeah. you know. Why is the kosher thing difficult? Well, because like you're on sets, you're not, you're not bringing your own food. I mean, I guess you can, but right. again, like it's just an extra thing to think about. Right. Um, actually on, on Gotham, they actually, they made me kosher meat. Oh, they did? Yeah. That's nice. I would great. think that, I would think that Shab like Shabbos, you could just put it, like that's your number one, yeah. like, uh, bottleneck in, in becoming an actor. That's your roadblock. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. sure. But there's definitely no reason, there's, uh, there's no reason you can't. You think it could be done? For sure. Again, I'll take you. I'll, and also, I didn't. I, I I grew up. You know, I grew up in a modern Orthodox community, but I also grew up in the center of West LA. So I always feel like I always felt like I was in a small Jewish town within a very large metropolitan, like you know, progressive city. So I felt like I had like I, I was really half half. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't. I just don't know what it's like to grow up in Crown Heights or right. you know. Right. It was um, very different. You. you were I'm sure. I'm sure it's very different. And also, I'm also thinking just to what you're asking, like. You're asking, like, can, can, can someone really fully Orthodox religious be an actor? Like, what about just, like, do you know how hard it is? Do you know how rare of a person we are? Like, at the end of the day, what you did was very rare. There's a lot of people, kids, who went to acting classes. Most of them don't make it. What's the therefore? What does that have to do with anything that you know, I know, it's just, I'm, I'm just <laughs> thinking out loud. There's no therefore. Honestly. I'm just thinking out loud of, like, it's crazy that, like, even being religious would make it even more difficult to do this thing that's already like a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of human beings yeah. in, the, in the population. But at least you should be it. able to, at least you should be told that yeah. religion is going right, to exactly. affect you. At least it should empower you. Like, right. hey, you could be, like the fact you're from does not play a role right. or at least a big enough role. That you can, you could do it. Yeah. You might, you probably exactly. will fail, but you could I do it. I think a lot of it is, <laughs> I think well, you may fail no matter what. That's the point. Like how much is, because right. I think a lot of it is told that because you're from, therefore it can't be done. Or like, it's not a good thing to be done. You can't yeah. be from because like- but, And there's other things also. I'm, I'm sure there are people who are told like, you're too ugly. You're not <laughs> gonna be a, a, yeah. an actor or this or that. But, For but sure. When religious, when religious religion is harnessed to be able to tell you that, I feel like it's, it has more of an effect on you in a certain way. Perhaps. It's, yeah. it's hard it, to know. Well, I just, I just think that if you grow up in like, in a community that is all encompassing Jewish, all encompassing, you know, like ab about your religion, mm -hmm. then yeah, it, 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 would, it would make it hard to, like just mentally even forget like the practical difficulties but mentally just like get yourself out of that box to to you know try to do something outside of it right um and that's that's the part that i would say like you know there's no reason why you you can't like yeah like like what you're saying there's no I mean, reason yeah. that you can't I'm just think a that huge, you can't do it. i'm a huge believer in that like I, there, yeah i just i'm a huge believer in going after what you want and and not taking no for an answer if you really believe in your gut you can pull something off like living with that regret to me is just not worth it you got to go for it yeah um, and a lot of people are gonna tell you no, for sure. That's a huge factor. So um, I think that's really interesting. Um, oh, I, well, I wanted to ask, you've been on like sets with Keeper Sutherland, you've been on sets with some big actors in Gotham and other projects. Um, are there any actors that you've been on set with that you felt like watching them act or watching their method you really learn from? Yeah, definitely. Um, Kiefer, for sure is like the primary example of that for mm -hmm. me because like I was, you know, I was still developing as a person at 10 years old and as yeah. an actor. You were 10 um, on that show. And we were, had most of our scenes together and I learned a ton from him. Um, I also learned a ton from like Ben McKenzie on Ooh, Gotham. On Gotham, yeah. Um, Who did he play? He played Commissioner Gordon or like okay. ro yeah. Rookie Detective Gordon when the show started. Right. Um, like well, just, this, this is like a fun anecdote. I don't know if you'll, I don't know if this matters to anybody who's not an actor, but like one of the things that he did that I found really interesting that we, he did like on our very first scene together was he was like I was like crying on the fire escape after my parents had died and he came and sat next to me and like as he's like giving me this you know like inspirational speech about how like you know to have hope and everything will be okay he like you know we, we were very close to each other our heads were like this and he, he was looking from like one eye to the other of mine just kind of going back and forth and it, and it just gave this effect of um, like really looking into my soul and like really searching um, as opposed to just like picking an eye and that was that that's something that I've always like 
you know, used as like a tool since, since then. So, and, and, you know, we never even talked about it. Um, I think he'd be surprised, like, if he heard me say this, that I even picked it up. But there, there's little things like that. Like, you know, for the most part, you don't really talk about, acting is very instinctual. And so a lot of things that you pick up, you don't really talk about. You don't really like, you know, someone's not like, hey, I'm going to give you this tip. It's more just that you notice someone do it. And you don't even, a lot of times, even consciously, you don't even realize that you're like, you know, right. doing something that they do. You're just kind of copying it. I like that. Yeah. Let me ask you. So I was watching, I watched your episode on The Office. You're growing up young, right? And you're obviously being introduced. A lot of times you're being introduced, like, it's probably concepts that younger kids shouldn't be introduced to. Like, I thought I saw you with Dwight Schroeder, which, by the way, is hilarious. Like, he was in there, like, you were yapping at him. Like, I don't know how it came up. Uh, yeah, something in. I don't remember the exact scene, like the exact thing. You were like talking about the fact that he looked like uh, he had boobs with like the uh, the the thing yeah, he was yeah. wearing. And I just like as a young kid, I always wondered like how does that work? Like are you like being exposed <laughs> to things that like. Yeah, but like you know, how bad is like saying boobs at nine years old? Right. I don't know. It's not. It's not the worst thing. Yeah, but sometimes it goes further than that. That's what I'm asking. Like. Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it never really did. And right. like my my like sometimes I would get auditions where like you know the like the comedy or the joke was that there was some really little kid like saying really heinous things, like really heinous curse words and whatever. And whenever I got those auditions, my mom would be like, "No, you're just not even gonna audition for this yeah. because like I don't. I don't. It's want like you a to thing. A lot of movies use that. The little kid saying really raunchy sex or stuff right. or, or curse words like. Because it's like an easy laugh, but yeah, like... Exactly. That's what I was saying. I never understood. Like, I don't know. As a parent, I don't know. I always wondered how they got people for that. I was like, um, yeah, I guess it makes sense for a lot of people in the world. Listen, yeah. Um, it's fame. Pe it's, people it's will sell true. their souls for a lot worse. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. A lot worse. You mentioned before, this is actually interesting because this goes on in our community as well. You mentioned before that your dad is like very serious religious. Yeah. Your mom is not so religious anymore. Yeah. Are they still married? Yeah. How does that work? Um, one, they each do their own thing and don't judge, judge each other. That's pretty cool. That's it's the amazing how he made that so simple. <laughs> and it's like, it makes sense also. <laughs> no, that's the simplest answer to what, what most people would still quantify as a complex problem. <laughs> you know, in our community, that definitely, that definitely happens. I mean, people don't want to talk about it. One of the things I do is I just talk about everything. I don't give a damn. Yeah. Um, same. So, I, try to be, I try to be the same way. Yeah. So like I don't, in our community, these are like very taboo things. Do not talk about the fact that there's definitely a... A handful of people, for sure. That, Probably more than we think. Yeah, more than we think that our, you know, guy's 35, goes on his own religious journey, even though he got married at 22, right out of yeshiva, and he's like, I don't know if I'm so interested in this. Yeah. And the, the, the wife is just this, like, little, sweet, little, edel woman that does not know what to do with herself. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, her husband is, like, turning the lights on and off on Shabbos, and she's just like, w what's happening? Um, but, but you just see it as... Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's super interesting for me. Like, I don't, I know. Obviously, I can imagine that kind of story happening, but I've never seen that, so that's interesting to hear about. You've never seen what? Well, just like you know, the story that you just described. But isn't that what's going on by in your own, like by by your parents? I, I guess, yeah, I guess. But it's not a thing you're saying. By them. I don't know. A lot of my friends don't have necessarily like you know, bo like religious parents. Like, right. You know, I, I I totally know what you mean by the whole like you know putting putting up a front. Like I've I've friends' parents who you know will tell anyone that they're religious and then like sneakily go on their phone and like right. I, I know that like you know they they'll they'll do stuff but you see them online or exactly on, like, everyone's been in that place in some way i feel like my friends have you know yeah um, religion's such a personal thing though that like yeah i mean it's it's 2022 like whether you're from the most right-wing new york or like modern orthodox or any any sort of background in any religious level in, as a jew like Everyone, most people are going on journeys. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And there's most but people also, have had periods in their life when they're going to be less religious or more observant, more spiritual, less spiritual. People spend a year as an atheist and then they're, you know, Chabad and then people's, yeah. we're all on journeys. But like, also like, I, I just think that the nature of the beast of the Jewish community is that everybody's in each other's business and like, oh, yeah. and people love to, to talk and judge and judge. And so like, that's, that's why, you know, in, in these communities, like, you know, um, you definitely have people putting up fronts to what, you know, like they, they to, not, to not let that happen, so to speak. Yeah. But don't you think that's the trade-off of community? Like having a community, what that makes that happen. Yeah. You have a lot of close, you have a lot of advantages with that. The disadvantage to having community is probably something like that. You know, yeah. people, you know, talking too much about what the next person is doing. Yeah. Yeah. The other option is to not have community. No one's talking about what you're or, doing, but then you have no community. Right. Exactly. Potentially there's a What's third the middle ground. Potentially well, potentially there's a third option, which is you have a loving community that is very tight and close, which I love about the Jewish community. But you raise a, enough consciousness and awareness around the issue of, hey, maybe we should let people breathe within it. And we already see Yeah. In, from a lot of our guests we've had in the pod, we see that this is happening. There are some people who are championing this. Like I, I my vision for the future Orthodox community is that they're a little bit less 
in each other's business. I, but yeah. I, I'll be honest. You know? I don't think, I'll tell you straight, I don't necessarily think that this is just an orthodox issue. I think communities in general, people oh, talk yeah, yeah, about each true. other. Not just, just like a, across the board. Like yeah. if you're in Hollywood, people are going to be talking about you because it's a close knit community. And if you're in a Christian community, I'm sure yeah. it goes up. Because the nature of people being in a community yeah. is that there's more gossip because I, I feel like that's a piece of it. Yeah. It's I do feel like part of it is a specifically Jewish thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. And not just Orthodox, just Jews, but like. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think Italians, I'm sure, are running the same, have the same shit going yeah, on. Interesting. I'm sure, like, the tight knit communities have that. Mm. Uh, religious communities in general have that. I feel like, listen, of course I'm with you on the goal would be to not have it and still right. have community. But I think that there could be a piece of that. And we should strive for that. But I think there is a piece of that that, that could be a little bit of an altruistic dream. And just realistically, it's probably not going to happen. We could make it better, I'm sure. Yeah. But I just feel like, you know, there's. Is that something that you, David, like specifically really appreciate because you've, since as a young age, have lived like a bi-coastal life and you're doing school here and then you're there and your life is a little bit more scattered mm -hmm. than, than other people's? Do you, do, is that yeah. something you really appreciate, just that sense of community, like you come back to LA? Oh, I love the community York. because whenever I was living in New York, I like, I didn't have much of a social life. I didn't have really friends in New York. All my friends were in LA, all it my It can community. be lonely being an actor. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't, I took, oh my God, I took the Jewish community for granted, like to a crazy extent and I didn't realize it until I moved to New York because like all I had in New York was work. And so whenever I wasn't working, which sometimes could be weeks at a time, and I'd have to just be sitting there because like they could always call me and be like, okay, schedule's changed, we need you tomorrow. And that was always Why couldn't you find friends there? I don't possibility. know. Just because I, I didn't, uh, how was I gonna find friends at right. he's, 15 he's on years a old? Yeah. He's young and there's I'm, I'm, in, yeah. I'm busy, I'm not going to school there. Right. Like I, I eventually did find some friends. Who were you living by when you were there again? I was with my mom. Your mom went there with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So no, they didn't just give like a 15 year old. My mom no, I thought maybe, I don't my know, maybe with a cousin right, right, or right. grandmother. Yeah. Huh? My, my mom gave up her practice um, to, to wow. move to New York. Wow. And yeah, so I didn't, I didn't, I, and, and it was less that, it wasn't even that just I didn't have like friends of myself, but like, you know, we didn't have people to like go to Shabbat dinner with. And like, it was, you know, you, you just didn't have a community. You didn't have the community. Yeah. I mean, you guys know like what the community entails and like of all, all, all of the, you know, incredible things like that, that come with she it. She called me up. I would have hooked you up in a second. Oh, Upper West Side. You were in Upper West Side, you said? Yeah. Oh, come on, there's too, there's too much going on there. We, we, we tried, mom. honestly, we tried. But oh, yeah. at, the, at the same time, it was like my mom and I were kind of a unit because we were both looking for a community. Right. And like what community were like, was a 15 year old boy and a 50 year old woman gonna find right. like together? You know, right. like we, we, ha we, we found people to go to Shabbat dinner with, but it was never, nobody ever that we'd like want to be you know, with. Yeah. Want, want to like call up again and hang out on a Tuesday. I hear that. I hear that yeah. 100%. Yeah, you, you know? can go to like Chabad dinner, but like. Exactly. And that, and that was great for the right. night. Right. I hear that. It's also interesting as a child actor that like you're, you're, you become, I don't know about you, but I had very little friends when I was 15, 16 that were adults and you were, were mainly your adults. work acquaintances were adults. Mainly, yeah. Most of the people you hung out with in your teenage years were adults. Yeah. That's interesting and, and, and weird. It's, yeah. it's different. Yeah. I think, I think I definitely matured quicker Too because, quick. of, because of that. No, I don't think too quick. Not too quick. You you come up that you are very well spoken. Like you you Thank do you, you do that. seem like for yeah. I mean, a lot of twenty one year olds in <laughs> these days sound like dumbasses. Like, no, he <laughs> is. Yeah, no, it's clear that yeah. at, for yeah. a twenty one year old, you're you're very like he said, very articulate, very well spoken. You have your thoughts in a row. So yeah. Also, I, I feel like we're like being a little age. Like we're not that much older than you. Yeah, like, no, you're not. We're like the same generation. But no, yeah. but in fairness, we're not that much older. But there are certain times in life where ages make a big difference. 21 to 30 is a huge difference. Once you hit a certain age, it doesn't make a difference really That's how true. old That's you are. True. There's certain life stages that just change things. You know, I feel like yeah. a little bit. Um, what, what's the dating story? Like, are you dating anyone? I'm not dating anyone or anyone right now. No. God, you look at married like young, or you want to wait till you're like 30? <laughs> I'm just curious. To, to date? No, like well, I'm just curious. I'm like, how many kids you want to have? No, no. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious. What's the like, question? How, how it works in your world? Do you guys like, like in the modern Orthodox world? I feel like they wait till like, especially you with your situation. Are you like? But I don't. I don't married at twenty one. I don't. Like, I don't feel very much. To be completely honest, I don't feel very much a part of the modern Orthodox community yeah. anymore. Like I, I when, once I like, I feel like the next stage of my life. I'm about to graduate college. The next stage of my life is going to be my career, and um, and you know, I'll I'll date here and there, and. You know, hopefully I find someone, but that's not like the the purpose of my life. And I would say the next like five, right. ten it's not years. Right, focus. You're waiting a little bit. Right, and then and then eventually, like you know, I I do want to have a family, um, in a traditional sense, at least right now. We'll see if I still want to do that in ten years. Um, and once I do, then I will have to make the decision of whether or not I want to raise my kids modern Orthodox. Like I was. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. that was and so I, I I don't know. I don't know right now whether or not I want. And the that. cool thing is, you don't need to know. Yeah. You got time. And also, you know, I, I'm only half of that decision at the end of the day. Right. Well said. I love that answer. That was good. That was a good way to put it. Um, 
My wife has to be Jewish or she has to convert for sure. Right. You're going to pull a Jared? Tell me. I said, are you going to pull a Jared? Who's Jared? I, I always joke around that. I, I think I coined the phrase of pulling a Jared. It means like you're, you're going to do what Jared Kushner did. And basically, well, the Kushners in general, they just find the hottest, most successful women in the world. Make them convert. And they just take them in and convert them. It's like a great way of like breaking into, like just <laughs> dominating like the world. Just to give Vanka. And it's just like, yeah, I become Jewish, bam. Take Carly Claus, bam. Like, you know, it's just like, yeah. I, younger, I call, that, pull, younger brother Mary I call that pulling a Jared, given yeah. that he was the one who did it first. But I, I feel like I genuinely, like also the, in the girls that I have dated, the ones that are Jewish, I find more connection with. Um, really? I feel, yeah. Not because you are, I mean, it was, but I, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's because I know that they're Jewish. Like a lot of times I don't even know that they're Jewish. And I'll find out and I'll be like, oh, that's why I feel like we vibe. Hmm. So I don't know. I, th I, think, I think there's a lot of Jewish sensibilities that are subtle that I can't even necessarily articulate. That's a good that, way to put it. That, I was going to say generational trauma, but sensibilities sound yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, generational trauma too. I mean, that's, that's, that's yeah. it. Um, that, you know, most of the girls that I find myself really liking are almost always Jewish. Really? Yeah. Is that like a, a sensitivity? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what that is. It's interesting. Is that like a he's saying it's like it's some sort soul of soul thing? Is that a soul thing? I think it's a soul thing. Yeah, it is. I think I think it goes very deep. Right. Wow. So I yeah I I'd, I'd be shocked if I married someone who wasn't Jewish. Yeah. Right. Is that like something that's important to you specifically just from a fundamental? Well, space? I just gotta have Jewish kids, right? Right. Like right. I, I don't I don't know if I want to raise them religious or not, but right. I they well, have I'm to Jews. be Jewish. Yeah. You want them in the tribe? Like just because Judaism is so such an important part of my life and always has been. Right. And like even less so religiously than culturally and historically like I, I i i my you know my mom's side my my ancestors like left spain during the inquisition in 1492 went to greece were holocaust survivors and then you know came to the states and had my mom on my dad's side during the second beta migdash they were koanim and lived in an island in tunisia and off the coast in an island called jerba for 2000 years and my, my dad was born in tunis you're going it's my so technically to be a Cohen, I am a Cohen, but technically to be a Cohen, you have to pass it down verbally, like and like elaborate, like explicitly from, mm -hmm. from father to son, father to son, father to son. Uh -huh. And once that like verbal explanation is lost, then you're no longer technically a Cohen. Okay. And my dad's dad wasn't religious at all, and so he never told my dad that he was a Cohen. Ah. In all likelihood, we probably are Cohen, even given our family history, Got it. but like. Regardless, like you could do a blood test, right? Um, but even if it comes back positive, I'm still tech. I'm st religiously, I'm not a Cohen, right? Got it. Wow. Because the, I didn't know that because the verbal connection's been lost. Yeah. That, that's what my dad always told me. Interesting, very cool. Um, but all that to say, like I'm very aware of my family history. I'm very aware of where I come from. I'm very aware of like, like if if you had to, if you told me like write down, you know, the most important things to you on a piece of paper, or, like what you want to live for, like Judaism is always at the top of the list. I love that. That's so cool. And so like, just because it's so important, even though it's like, it's not something that I practice on a daily basis, like existentially, what, I'm, what I live for, it's very, very important to me. Like my kids have to be Jewish. It's just not, it's not a right. negotiable thing. I love it. Love it. All right. But I, I assume most Jews are like that, to be honest. Yeah, no, I mean, not every, I mean, there is a decent amount of assimilation going on. I mean, some people just don't give a shit, you know, if their kids are Jewish. I think yeah. that exists also. But I love hearing that. Like someone who's, you know, it's cool. Can I ask um, last two like rapid please, fire go questions? For it, go for it. Just quick rapid fire rapid questions. Fire, yeah, tell me. Is it an actor or a director that you would love to work with? Yeah, hold on. If you could and manifest. Favorite it. actor. Come on. A favorite director. So favorite actor. Oh, I I feel terrible saying Christian Bale, but it probably is Christian Bale. Just because everything. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Well, just because like it's so obvious, you know. It's a okay. Class. After it's... Christian Bale, fine. That's, not <laughs> That's like saying who do you think is the best basketball player? Out like yeah, okay. You can't give you if you're a great ball player. Like if yeah. I ask LeBron James, who's the best bat. Not Christian yeah. Bale. Well, the only reason I say Christian Bale is obvious is just is less that he's like one of the most famous and like prestigious actors, but more that he played Batman and like I right. played That's Batman. Why I'm oh, you, can't, oh, you know, oh, so yeah. like it's just obvious for me to say yeah. like it's not an interesting out of the box answer. That's why is there I'm a director? It can't be him. It has to be someone else. Has to be someone else. Um, uh, I, I don't know if she's my favorite actress, but like I just saw her in White Lotus and thought she was, you know, Aubrey Plaza, absolutely outstanding. No, Jennifer Coolidge. <laughs> in, in, in season in season two, like they're oh my god, there's something incredible about watching her. Yeah, no on. spoilers because I just started season two. Okay, is she very hot? No, she's not. Okay, fine, good. Because I was well, she's I hot. mean, that depends on your <laughs> subjective. No, I was gonna say if she's hot, then you're biased to this like. No, no, she's she is absolutely incredible. Okay. She 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 manages to give a performance that's completely unpredictable but completely consistent at the same time, which is that's... very difficult to do. It's very campy, also. But it's, it's so realistic too. Like I she is, yeah. she's a campy person, but you believe that she exists in the real yeah. world. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way the, dia the, the dialects he's making are very good. Like 
the yeah, way he's yeah, yeah, yeah. setting those up. I like I'm, that. I'm very excited. I just started season two, so I'm, I'm um, actor but, though. What actor? Actor. <laughs> I like. I'm curious. Okay, like, misogynist. No, uh, you said actress. <laughs> I'm asking actor. <laughs> Um, By the way, I'm the well known. <laughs> <laughs> Never <laughs> mind. It's funny that he said that. Though. <laughs> no, whatever. Go on. I'll tell you afterwards. I'm not going to bore the pod to death here. Um, it's I, I, my, I would say one of my next choices would be Adam Driver, but I don't. I don't have like a favorite. This is funny because you're not going with the typical people that I would just think you said. Like, that yeah. I would think. First, Adam Driver is one of those guys that like he just brightens up any a movie. movie, anything he's in. Yeah, like just. Have you seen White Noise, the new movie on Netflix? No, I read the book that's no, based on. That. So, really? Yeah. How's yeah. the book? Very inaccessible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the movie's pretty inaccessible. Cool. <laughs> Check it out. What was the, I apologize for asking you the same. What was the question you asked? Oh, who would you want to be? You asked. Right? Which, well, no, who would no, I want to no. work with? And the so director that you want director, to work with? Director. Um, the first person that I thought of when you, when you asked the question was Wes Anderson. That's awesome. I didn't um, see that coming. But, I'm a big Wes fan. But, you like that like quirky kind of like sardonic look? Yeah, rip? yeah. I think it'd be super fun to do. Um, I think it'd be super fun. I'm to trying do. to imagine you in Tweed right now. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, could, it could work. <laughs> I just want to really, you know, David, I really want to say thank you for you're obviously the biggest person we've had on. Um, given your status, social media following, you play Bruce Wayne. No more need to be said. I know you're also not feeling well, right? So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, Zach, I know you wanted to say thank you as well, I believe. So yeah, um, I really like this was a really real conversation. And uh, you said you told us that you don't you don't go on too many podcasts. If people see this, like hopefully you'll get invited to more because I think you got a lot to share. Cool. All right, yeah, I appreciate you saying yeah. that. Yeah, and and if we take off and and become you know second to Joe Rogan and take off in Hollywood, I oh, mean yeah. it's definitely thanks to you. Cool. <laughs> so, cool. Just remember me. Yeah, we, we definitely will not forget you. Dinner at a, what, Jeff's? Is Jeff's, that Jeff's. Dinner man. at Jeff's on us. Okay. Well, yeah. Definitely dinner at Jeff's on us. I have no problem doing that. Um, again, thank you so much. Guys, I hope you enjoyed. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Appreciate all feedback always. Like, subscribe, comment. Thank you. Peace and love, everyone. Peace and Take love. Take care.